Hi all, so I thought I'd just explain a little bit about the yarn you use while using an ink or loom. So I've got a selection of ones here and why some would be a good idea and some would be a bad idea. Okay, so let's just roll out the really bad one first, shall we? So this stuff, as beautiful it is, and I'm sure it would make a lovely bout or strap or something because it's so soft. As you can see, it's bitty. It has eyelashes, whatever you want to call it. That will clump together and felt together as you're using it and it would actually become pretty near impossible to continue weaving with it because these would just get stuck. So it's really a bad idea to use this sort of stuff in weaving unless you know what you're doing because this can be a lot of hassle. So as pretty as this stuff is, stay away from it when you're just starting. This is another one that looks like it might be okay. If you look closely, you can see that it's got little wisps of um, yarn, or in this case, wool, sticking out. Now, the thing is with wool, as lovely as it is to weave with, um, it felts with friction and heat, and when you're weaving in and out, the threads will continue to pass each other like this, and that will cause a lot of friction and cause this to felt. Um, so unless you very carefully make sure everything is thoroughly separated each time you pass through, this could become a problem. Um, so it's really not recommended for beginners to work with something that has a wool content or a foutable content. Now these two are just your basic acrylic yarn. This is a King Cole Splash and this is a Robin DK. Now, they do have, if you can see, they do have the little bits of fluff on them. But these, because they're not wool, they don't felt as easily. So though they can get a little stuck every so often, you, it is reasonably easy just to separate them off again. Um, so these aren't too bad to use, but again, it's still a little more different than a smooth yarn. These are cotton, and they're two different types of cotton. This one's just your basic cotton. Um, this is Dolly's. Um, there's a label in it. So it's just a basic cotton. Um, and this will work great because they're not going to really felt, um, and they're going to be smooth. Whereas this one is a DMC cotton, and this one is actually, as you can see from the shine, it's really smooth and makes a lovely piece to work with when weaving because it just the pieces will just easily glide past each other. So a smooth cotton is really the best thing to use when you're just starting out and you're learning what to weave it. But what you also have to be careful with is if it's too smooth, it can be slippery on the actual ink or loom. Um, and make tension a problem as you're pulling along and weaving along. So it's a um, weighing up the good and the bad, the pros and the cons, to which type you use. More often than not, I will use this non-smooth cotton or a basic acrylic. Then you can get linens and other types of threads and they can be great to use. But just for beginners, stick with the cheaper stuff until you are really good at working with the yarns, working out your tensions, working out the slippage and the any felting problems. Once you've worked on that, you can start working with more luxurious yarns and more experimenting. But stick with basics for just for the beginning. Um, you can still get some really pretty cottons um, and some really pretty acrylic cheap yarns for which will be great for practicing with. So stick with them. For the heedles, which I will show you how to make, I've just got a basic dishcloth cotton. This stuff tends to withstand a lot of use and I like to use my heedles more than once. So this is just a basic, I think this is James C. Brett, I'm not sure. Didn't really come with a label much, even though they were bought new. The label didn't state who it was, just that it was dishcloth cotton. Um, 
but this I find makes great heedles because it's really strong and can withstand a lot of pulling. That's something else you will need to be careful with on your yarns. If it's a weaker yarn, they can snap under the tension. So try to make sure you've got a pretty strong yarn to work because the tension will get quite a lot on these ink looms as you're weaving, the more tension it will have. But I will explain more about tension later. The other thing that you'll need is your shuttles. Now I've got two different type shuttles here, neither of them are what comes with a proper ink or loom. Um, they come with different type we weaving looms that I had, but I got all my stuff second hand and so I never got the proper shuttles and so it just shows you can work with items you have. So I use these as the actual shuttles for the weft of the weaving and I will explain what weft is um, later on while we're warping up the loom. But these will work great for carrying your yarn backwards and forwards. And then I just use a beveled ruler because you need something with a slightly beveled edge to push against your weave to keep it straight and to encourage it to sit nicely next to the next weft. So you want to push all your wefts down. So this will be great for using that. So check back when I show you how to start off loop weaving with your loom. Hi guys, I'm just going to show you how you make the heedles and you do that by using this bottom one here which is where you're going to be holding your heedles, so the heedle rod and your top one which is above the heedle rod. So on different setups these will be in different places but these two usually are in the same place so that you can measure your heedles correctly because what you want when you're setting up is your heedles to be the halfway point so if you just take your yarn and then tie it around like that and then snip off your ends that's your first heedle because when you set up later I'll show you you'll put it on and then you'll have it over your yarn and down and that'll be your halfway point so you're just going to keep doing that so just tie the yarn around. Try to make sure it's a reasonably good knot so they don't slip undone because of course they will be under a fair amount of pressure. And if you can keep the ends reasonably short they will prevent it getting stuck in the weave. So I'm just gonna make a load and leave them on it if I put the other one on this way you can keep count of how many you got <laughs> you can get it back on because it's tight so just tie around and you need half the amount if you're doing an even number you'll need half the amount of heedles when you're doing threads so if I was weaving a 20 shred shred 20 thread pattern I need 10 heedles so it's always best to have spare just in case but it's literally just tying these around hoping you can see that all right and just cutting them off so you're just gonna continue making them and as you can see they're just rested on them out of the way. So it's just the length for this and then tied off. So that's all you need to do to make the heedles. So it's really simple. Some people call them heddles, some people call them heedles. I don't really know. I don't think the pronunciation works uh, matters too much because they work the same whether you pronounce them one way or the other, don't they? Okay, so I will come back and show you how to set up soon. Um, first I'm going to show you the different types of looms that I have, okay? Okay, here's two of the inkle looms that I have. The one in front here is an Ashford, and the one in the back here, I think it's a handmade one by someone, because um, there's no markings on it. I got both of these from a car boot sale. Um, this Ashford I got for two pound fifty. She didn't even know what it was. Um, so you can pick up some bargains. So just keep a look out. But what I want to show you is, though, as you can see, they are different in style. The bases are the same, so I'll just get one of them on the table a minute and I'll explain them. 
Okay, so this is the, what I assume to be homemade one, um, because I don't have any markings. So I don't know if there's another one exactly like this out here, but I said they're all going to be basically the same. So you have your post here, which is where you're going to be tying off when you set up your loom. You've got a hoop there for your first one. Um, and that will be the same on every loom, as far as I know. And then you have these two, which this is your heedle one. In this case, as you see, it has a split down the middle. In the other one, it didn't, but I'll show you that in a minute. And then this is the top one. You're going to go over or under, depending on whether it's heedled or not. But I'll explain that more later. So, almost always, there'll always be these two in line as well, next to this one. And then... This one here is a little different than the others. Often you'd have several different ones for different lights. This one's been designed so you can actually take it out and put them into different places. And this will create a different length um, strap. Let's just put it back on that one. It does have a tie thing, but as you can see, it's not stuck in very well. Because I'll put it back together in a minute. <laughs> um, as I said, it's, this is just one cheap off the car boot but it works, and that's all that matters. And then you have your top one, which they will all have. And then this is where it gets a little different. So you have this one, but this one is the tension. Now in some, and the one you'll see in a minute, you'll have up here, and in some places, the tension rod is here, and can move along. So different ones will have a tension rod in a different place, but they all work basically the same and that is that they shift to help with the tension um, on this one you've got a little thing down here which you'll need to unscrew to be able to move this once a little harder doing it one-handed but you see this will come out so as you've got your thread going down and around this will be able to go in as the tension gets tighter and to tighten up to start with you can go out and that puts a strain on it and it goes underneath it goes around underneath here all the way back to the beginning so that's this one that as you see it works basically the same even though the tension is in a different place and there's a different setup here so i'll just show you my asteroid one now okay so this is my asteroid so as you can see you've got your starting rod with your little hook in here again, same as the last one, and we go along, and this is one of the strap rods that you'll go around, which will be explained when we go around, and same with this one, these are all ones that you can work around, they work within these three when they wrap up and down. As with the other one, you've got your heedle rod, and your top one, which is where we were measuring our heedles on, and then with this one, the tension rod is actually the top. And this can swing round to various places depending on where you need the tension. Obviously at that position there'd be only this is the tension. But on these positions you'd be pushing the band out given it is tension. And that's just a twisty knob that locks it in place. I haven't done it very tight but if you do it tight it's locked in place. And you go around these. And the same, you'd go around there and then depending on the length you'd end up coming out around here and you'd go all the way round and down and under. So it works the same way no matter what style you have, there's always the same basic components. So if you're stuck always look for the tension rod whether it's here, down here or over here because that will help keep your band even. Okay so we'll start setting one up. Okay hey, well so we're going to do the warping for setting up. I'm hoping this angle is going to be alright for you. I know I'm going to block the cam off on a stretch over, but unfortunately I can't find any other way to do this. So, sorry about that. So the first thing we're going to do is just create a slip knot and hook it onto that hook I showed you at the very beginning. So it's the one right next to your rod. It's not all of them have them, but most of these inkle looms have them. So you just hook it onto there so that way it's secure for warping up. Okay, so this is the warp, the part we're going up, and an inkle loom, anything woven on inkle, is known as a warp based piece because we will see the threads that are about to wind up. The weft, which is on the shuttle, we won't see. 
so this is known as walk face. So if you see anything that says walk thread, know that I'm um, walked faced, know that it's the colours you're using to set up your piece. Okay, so once we've got it secured down here, we're going to go up to the first post, and that's the one up here. What we're going to do is pop your first heater on. So these are your heedle ones, and the ones that don't have these heedles on are known as open threads, and I'll show you that in a minute. So we just pop your heedle on the heedle bar at the bottom here, go behind your thread, over the top of your thread, and then hook that on. So if I just zoom in, and I can show you that again. So you hook your Get your thread, you hook it on there, behind your thread, so you're moving it, then over and down to hook on, and there you've hooked your heedle thread on. Okay? Let's go back out again. Okay, and then we're going to go across to the tension one on this one. It could be just a top rod. Um, on my other one is just the top rod, but this one is the tension one. We're just going to go around that one, and um, literally all the way around, and underneath that post. Tighten that up a bit so it doesn't move a minute. Okay, and then you go underneath your heedle one. You don't want to go above. Make sure you go underneath it. And then here is the first post. This is your beginning post, which is where you're going to start your threads. And this is the first one to start going backwards. So this is the one you want first. So you go over the top of it, around under it, and then these remaining posts, you want to make sure you go above them. And you're going to head to this post below this one, because this is the next one unworked. So you just go up above and around that post. And now you're going to go down to the next unworked post. And you're going to wrap around that one. And then up to this one, the next unworked post. And you're going to follow along this path, just going along to each of the next unworked posts. Now it's easy to do when you're facing the front. For me, it's a little more awkward doing it at this angle. But see, so we get to this last unworked post here, and we can go back to the very back post. That's the one that's on its own back here. We go back. We're going to go around that one. And then we go underneath all of these bottom posts and underneath the very front one and you're going to go up. And that's where your first walk is done. So you push all them back because you want to make sure that none of them slide off. So always try to push them back as you go. Okay, so they're all back. It's now time to do the next strand. Now the last one we did was with a heedle and above the top here. So the next one's actually going to go underneath there. So we're going to go through the middle of those two and straight up to that tension one and around. So the top post. So the first one we wrap around is the very back top one. We go through the middle of these two. And then remember it's underneath the heater one. Straight to the first one you haven't worked in this row. Around that one above the rest of them and work in to the one you haven't worked yet. So that's this one in this case. And then back down. And you can always tell which one you've worked because they should always have the same amount of threads on. So this one had two on to match here, but this one only had one on, so that's the one we're going to work. And the same here. This one has two on, so we want to work the one below it. And just go backwards and forwards on each one. Wrapping them around. Ooh. As I said, it's easier for someone who's not doing it at this angle. <laughs> then underneath, all the way along, and back to the front. Give them a push in so they're staying on. This just makes sure that your walk doesn't fall off the edge. Some inkle looms actually have an enclosed part so that they don't come off, but my ones don't. Okay, so now we've done this one last, 
we need to go to the top one, which remember is a heedle one. So grab your heedle and you want to hook that on there. Take your thread up above, take this behind and catch it on. Try to make sure you don't have that in the way. <laughs> so now you've caught that one on, push it on. So now you have one open thread that's nothing it's attached to and two heedle threads which are attached to your heedles. And this is what will help create your shed. These open ones will move up and down creating the shed for weaving. And the shed is the section you're working um, and the pieces go up and down to create the weaving. I'll show you more of that once we're done. But so we're going to keep going and repeating this process of backwards and forwards. So remember underneath the heater one always when you're coming back like that and just find the one that's not worked with that correct amount of number of strands and just keep going back and forwards. Now if you wanted to do a shorter piece you wouldn't need to wrap all of these. I'm just doing the longer, excuse me, sorry, I'm doing the longer piece because that way I show you how to wrap every stick, every rod. Um, but if you wanted to do a shorter piece, you could literally just go all the way around, around the base, and that would be the shortest piece if you didn't use any of these rods. And if you wanted to have a slightly shorter one, you could miss the first two rods and only work the next ones. And you can choose to use as many rods as you like to create the length you like. So for this one, we're just going to keep going. So if you notice, the last one we done was a heedle. So we're going to go in between the two, then up to the tension. So that's now created a second open shed, see, because it's free to move. Okay, so underneath the heedle one, and then work the unworked rods, and she go. this is much easier to do if you're not working from the side like I am <laughs> or from the front however you want to look at it okay so now we have two heels and two opens so what I'm going to do is just secure this off temporarily so that I can show you some close-ups um, and then I will finish wrapping it and show you how to secure it off correctly so that just holds it in place. It's a good way if you need to take a break to secure your thread. Just wrap it around the end nozzle a few times and then hook it onto your little hook. And that secures it in place and you can come back to it later. And if you can't remember which one you should be working, just look to see whether your last one was an open or a heedle. So I will show you close-ups of them in a minute. Sorry about any wobbling, I just got to disconnect the camera from the tripod. <laughs> okay, see, so the first one is linked onto this here, and then I've just wrapped around a few times and hooked it on there to um, secure it while I show you. So it's not actually finished off yet, but here's the heedles and the open threads. Um, come from the side. See, you've got the two open threads that move up and down, and the two heels, they're pretty much stuck in place. See, so the heels have gone up the top, the open thread goes between those two, and over to there, and then they follow the same path all the way down and around. So, we've gone, let's come out a bit, so we've gone up along here, down, and underneath the heedle to the first post, work around that post, back up to this post, around that post, down to this one, around that one, up to this one, around down to this one, and then up to this one. Then we've gone finally around this one to the very back one, which we followed it all the way along back to start again. And that is how you do your basic warp. So I'm going to finish doing this and then we can show you how to start weaving. Okay, see you soon.
Okay, once you get to the end and you've done all that, you need to secure off. So what you need to do is take your first piece that you've got on your little hook here and slide that off. Keep hold of it. Make sure that your last piece is on the underside and you're just going to tie them together. I tend to tie in the middle of it because it just prevents too much off angle. Tie them, sniff off your ends and you're ready to start weaving. So get your shuttle ready and I can start showing you how you start the weaving, okay? Okay, now it's ready the weaving. What I actually do with my needles is I just give them a little push down my finger. Just evens them out so that they're more even tension on it. And then depending on how much tension you got, you decide whether you want to adjust your tension out. It's very hard to do one hand this but you just decide so that you've got a good tension, not so tight that you're going to break it, you need room to manoeuvre. But the way you create the shed is this open thread, you push it down and that creates your shed to work in. And then you push it up and that creates your second shed to work in. And that's how you work. So, just push this down and what we're going to do is start off the weaving down here. So I'll just re-secure the camera and we'll be right back. Okay, so I've got my shuttle ready, and it's just wrapped a load of yarn on. If you remember from the beginning, this was a whole brand new ball. This is all that's left. So it does take a lot of yarn to use for ink or weaving. But, so all we're going to do, is we need to create the shed we're going to use by pushing down. So it's just... I need to do up, come out of it. We push down to create our shed, so we've now created our first shed down for this. And we're just going to pass the shuttle through, so that you have your end woven in. So if I just zoom back in down the bottom so you can see. So you can take your shed. Oop. Sorry, I'm over the camera so it's a bit awkward for me. But you take your shirt and you just pull it down to the bottom. I like to leave a reasonably long town because that will allow for you to finish off the end when you go. So you've got your shed in there, um, it, you've got your weft in your shed. You now need to create the next shed that you need to work with. So remember, we pushed down last time, so we're now going to push up with the shed. And now that it's been pushed up, we're just oops, sorry. We're just gonna pass our shuttle back through and take this down. Now give it a little pull down. Now you will get places where it crosses over because this is the beginning. Once you've got a little further up, it will become easier to work with. So just pull it in. You wanna pull it until you just feel the end of your piece get to the end here and then then use your in my case a ruler but usually a beta just to push it down so it's in place more secure okay and then again we're going to create the new west so I'm going to go down because it's just been up go under and again I'm going to pull it down and pull it so that it's just along because you don't want to pull it in too tight. Make sure you can get into your weft, into your shed, sorry, and push that down. You can pull up your weft again and push down from there, it gives it even better. I'm going to keep doing that. So if I just show you from the side what the action is. So we were just down, so we're now going to pull it up and we're going to go in to this section. So if you grab, normally you wouldn't reach through but I'm doing this one-handed. 
Hold on. Right. So you grab your shuttle and you go through. And then you pull this through. And again, you would not be doing this one handed. <laughs> but you pull it through. Push down so you can get into your shed. And then just push this down so it becomes even. So each time you've done one, you just want to pull up, work into that one, push down, work into that one. And that's how you'll do your weaving. It's just a matter of pushing up and down on these bits. And as you get along, you will need to shift this, but I'll show you that when we're done. Okay, so I've now done up the length this part of the van. Now, as you see, we're getting really close to where the heedles are. Now, I could squeeze in a couple more there, but I'm not going to for now. It's just it's easier to, if you have more room to manoeuvre um, for beginners, so trying to squish that through for a beginner might be harder. So I su suggest leaving about that sort of gap between the thing. You'll notice when I first started, I had these down here for the tension. As I move up, I move them up. Sorry, I'm trying to do this one handed. So I move them up, and that gives you just a little more space to continue um, and keeps the tension a little more even as these gets tighter. But moving them up will weave in the tension again. So, what you need to do now is once you've run out of space up there, is you need to shift them all. So, as you can see, we started down here and See, it's a little uneven when we start here, and that's okay, because the further you go along, the more even it gets. Now, what you do have to be careful for is not to pull in too tight, because then you start creating kinks in it. Like, if I pulled the current one tighter, you can see we would have created a kink. So, you don't want to pull too tight. I can fix that in a minute. But also, if you stay too loose... Uh, go down here and um, let it focus again. Yeah, so if you go too loose, you can still see the weft where you really only want to see the warp and you no longer see the weft. So that's depending on the size of your yarn you're using and how many strands will depend how thick your band is. But this one is not a bad size for a basic layer. I've got some thicker ones which I'll show you in a minute. Um, it depends entirely on the sort of thickness you want to how many strands you use and the pattern you want. Um, if you want a large amount of pattern in it, using a thinner yarn would be better. But if it's just a plain weave like this, then a thicker yarn works just fine. Um, so, in order to move this, I'm going to have to put the camera down. So I'm just going to sit it down and hope you can see what I'm doing, okay? Okay, so all we're doing is we're just grabbing this and we're giving it a pull. Now, it's not easy and you kind of have to shift everything along, including your heedles. You just kind of have to give it a pull. If it's not moving too much, what you do is just loosen your tension. Um, so you can show you up here. So if it's not moving too much, loosen your tension off. You loosen it right off. So now like there's no tension on this, this is as loose as it goes. So that you can then shift it and then you can put your tension back. So I'll try and do this so you can actually see, sorry. <laughs> Having a non-slip mat makes it a little easier, but I lost mine, so and as I have so many, you just kind of got to encourage it. It's not a simple task because there's so many strands you've got to follow along. So you just kind of move it along little by little and allow it to pull. As you see, it is shifting, it just takes a little while. I need to reach the other end a minute, so I just need to pull them so that it shifts along. Okay. 
if you can pull it from two different ways it's easier but obviously I was trying to do it one way so you want to pull up with one hand pull down with the other hand until you get to where you're weaving about there you don't want to go any lower than that that's fine so if you you're looking was it about an inch I don't know I'm not good at guessing sizes but now we've shifted it all along ready to start weaving along there again now what you're going to want to do is make sure that all your bits are still across because often while you're shifting these start to slide closer to the edge so make sure that they're not coming off the end and then don't forget to go back and redo your tension so for me it's about there Oops, sorry, can you see that? Yeah, so the tension is now back in place and make sure again they're all even so I've just pushed them down so they're even and that's giving me my tension and now I have a whole new section of shed to start working Okay, remember, that's one shed, and that's the other shed. And this is how simple it is to do. Um, as I said, just keep working on your thing. Try not to go in too tight, like, like I will need to go back and correct that where I called it. But don't go too loose. But it doesn't matter if the beginning part is loose, because this bit will actually be cut. Because um, when we get to this, there will be a point along here where it can't be separated that this won't be able to be worked and this is where you're going to be cutting so this bit will end up this bit here in the beginning will end up in that section and it won't actually be the end point it will actually be cutting off and then you'll sew across that bit and what I mean by that if I show you these are two bands that I done many years ago <laughs> this one here is just done with a basic variegated yarn so you get some pretty patterns just by using a variegated yarn. And this one here is a pickup pattern which I will show you at a later date but not for today. Um, and the background is a slightly thinner yarn than the top because it makes it pop out more. The back of this one just looks like that. You can do double sided ones and I will show you them at some point. Unfortunately I've got no samples left of the double sided ones so I can't show you them. But all I've done on the ends of these, so you can see just along there when it focuses again, so it's just it's sewn several times back and forth over here, and that secures the ends in so they won't go anywhere. And it's done the same on that side. See the ends there are frayed, but this is so sewn so many times it doesn't come undone. And it also has a crisscross, so I can show you probably better. Can you see that crisscross there? If my camera focuses, yeah, see, so there's a zone going across there as well as several times across there, and that's all it needs to secure it. Now, these are obviously just one type of product you can make, it's just sewn across there to hold the ring in place. I've made key rings and bag handles and belts and all sorts, so there's a lot of different products you can make. Um, and if I can find any more samples, I will show you them, but I think I may have sold them all. Um, but I will show you how to do this sort of thing at a later date. But for now, we are doing just what this one is, which is a plain weave. You'll see the plain colour, just a nice simple colour, but if you do all the variegated, depending on the type of variegated, depends on the look, but you can get some really pretty results. This was just a basic rainbow variegated cone yarn that I had. I don't even know what it was, it was just something I was gifted a long time ago. But I think it came out rather pretty. Um, yeah, unfortunately I don't have any other ones to show you, but we can at some point. But yeah, so you're just going to continue weaving these, just like we said, all the way until it gets to the point that your weaving end, this end here, meets up here. Because once you get to that point, you won't be able to separate them off to go over. And that is where you will just snip. You won't have to do anything beforehand. So once you've woven up to this point, and that end is up there, 
just take a pair of scissors and cut down the middle there. They won't unravel, so don't worry. You just literally cut it and then just take your sewing machine. You can hand sew it, but I tend to use a sewing machine. And sew backwards and forwards several times over the end sections. And then you can snip it close and be fine. And then at that point, you can then decide what you're going to do and what you're going to make with it. I'm going to turn this camera around a minute. Oh yeah, now I can see you. <laughs> yeah, so once you've decided what you want to make with it, you can then do any finishing touches to it. I mean, some people keep them long and actually have braided ends, um, so you could do that. I would still sew across the edge next to the weaving just to keep it secure, but not everyone does. It's just something I like to do for an extra piece of security. Um, you can just braid it and leave it. But you also, for if you're leaving it for an end, not crossed over like this and just literally open, I would sew across the ends, snip the ends and then fold it in and sew again, creating a hem like you would um, a normal garment because um, that gives it a neater edge and tucks it away. Because um, these can be made into bags and all sorts and I'll probably do a bag at some point to show you how all to do it. But I'm hoping this has at least explained most of it for you. Once I've finished this, I will pop a separate video up of me actually finishing it off so that you can see. But I figured if I get this out now, you can at least start on the weaving. And um, then you can just worry about watching the end part um, once you finish your weaving. So you don't have to wait for me to do the whole thing before you get started. <laughs> So I hope that's helped, um, any questions below please pop them down there um, because I'm happy to answer or refilm anything that I've not made any sense on or the angle wasn't quite right, I'll try to fix any angles I can uh, and I will get some pickup patterns and some plain weave patterns out hopefully within the next month um, but I don't want to promise. <laughs> But yeah, there are, the way we've done this just now, that plain weave up and down, there are patterns you can do that are just that plain weave before you have to even worry about doing pickup patterns. Because though simple, it is more of a uh, intermediate level doing these sort of patterns. Um, and that might be something you get to really quickly. But it might be something it takes you a little longer. So don't worry. Take your time. It's not a race. And I will find some basic weave patterns to do first. Um, so you can get used to loading up the yarn to correct the patterns. Because for even pick up you will need to know how to load up the yarn to get the correct colours in the correct places. So if you start with a basic weave pattern you'll start to understand how to read a pattern and how that works because I will show you how to read the patterns that you can find online. Um, and then we can start with doing some pickups. Right, so I hope that all helps and I will hopefully get this up pretty soon uh, and I'll see you all later.